What time do you have, Peter? Is it about four minutes too? Uh, six fifty-nine. Oh, good. Okay. The computer time is always right. I don't look at my watch, but the computer time is right because I think it's uh, astronomical time. And now it just clicked on to seven o'clock. <clears throat> so let me welcome everybody uh, to the uh, to the winter lecture series uh, subtitled uh, Global Perspectives. This is the second of four sessions for this year. I'm Peter Levitoff, and I'm the chair of the planning committee. Um, our session this year uh, is, as uh, you know, uh, the <clears throat> Can Democracy Be Saved? The Global Trend Towards Strong Man, No Strong Woman, But Strong Man Rule. And uh, last week we had a, a, a very uh, intriguing conversation with uh, Zoltan Barney uh, on uh, Hungary. And we're going to have another talk today on Brazil. But before I introduce the introducer, uh, I just want to say that uh, we are sponsored by uh, the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, the so its Social Action Committee, also by Humanities Nebraska and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. Uh, and uh, if you if you did miss last week's lecture or you know someone who's going to miss this week's lecture, uh, they will be available on the uh, Unitarian YouTube uh, channel uh, next week. There was a glitch in putting last week's on. Uh, it was supposed to be on by today, but it will be on sometime in the next couple of days along with this week's. And that channel, I'll uh, just repeat it again, is uh, youtube.com slash Unitarian Church of Lincoln, all as though it's one word. Uh, so uh, if you did miss last week, look in a, look in a few days, maybe later in the week, and, uh, and you can get uh, Zoltan Barani's uh, lecture on, on Hungary. Uh, and now, uh, on with the show, let me introduce to you uh, Professor uh Emeritus Chuck Francis, uh, professor of agronomy and uh, one of the one of the world's most well known people in the field of agroecology, and he will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Peter, uh, and welcome, Dr. Hunter. My pleasure to introduce you tonight, and I'll do that quickly so I can get out of your way. Um, Dr. Hunter has spent. Uh, well, first we started, you know, we ended up in California, so we had Greece, which we talked about earlier. She was at um, Vanderbilt University for about 10 years and then moved to Texas and was had several positions there, but also had a uh, fellowship with, with uh, the Kellogg Foundation. I noticed I was looking at the background. Uh, he's a social scientist, a political scientist, and a government specialist, and knows Brazil and the Southern Cone and the rest of Latin America very, very well. Uh, she works on social policy issues in Latin America with special attention to politics of education and health reform. She's also published a book on the Workers' Party of Brazil. She currently works on issues concerning identity documentation in the developing world. She's the author of several books as well as a wide range of publications. A uh, recent book on the transformation of the Workers' Party in Brazil, 1989 to 2009 from Cambridge. And another book from North Carolina Press, Eroding Military Influence in Brazil, uh, Politicians Against Soldiers. She's published articles in a number of journals. You'll recognize Comparative Politics, Comparative Political Studies, Political Science Quarterly, and several others. So it's a real pleasure and an honor for me to introduce uh, Professor Wendy Hunter from the University of Texas at Austin. So, Wendy, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I appreciate it. And I look forward to the conversation. So um, I followed the charge of asking whether democracy can be saved in Brazil. And the reason that that is, was ever even a question um, 
was the recent presidency of Jair Bolsonaro from 2019 to 2000, through 2022 and his lingering presence. His lingering presence was made very notable today because he rallied um, thousands of people in his support in uh, downtown Sao Paulo. Okay, I'm trying to get the thing to advance. Now it's not doing it. Um, Go ahead and click share screen. Okay. I'm hitting desktop. Share. Are you seeing it? There it is. Okay, so why is it not moving? I'm trying to get it to advance. Uh, there it is down on the bottom. Okay, here we go. Okay. So um, let me just start by showing you some scenes. Uh, what you see here um, are scenes that uh, were very prominent during Bolsonaro's presidency. Uh, he really made use of the Brazilian flag. The prominent colors of the Brazilian flag mark his movement. And this is in opposition to the major opponent of his, uh, which is the Workers' Party, which comes out in red. Um, so you really see the, the flag here. Um, this business here is um, basically he tried to elevate the law and order um, position and people arming themselves. So he was known for doing this. Little kids were going around doing this. Um, he was also close to President Trump. So uh, I included a shot of him with the president. Okay, a couple more scenes before we get into the analysis. Um, the center picture is Bolsonaro mixing it up with the crowd. Um, this was him in his element, and that's why he's really a populist. His favorite position is just an unmediated relationship to the masses. Um, he very frequently rode a horse in these um, settings. He was actually stabbed in the campaign um, and came within about 10 minutes of losing his life. Nonetheless, he just continued to go out and mix it up with the crowd. Um, the campaign ad, Super Live, I included that because I there are two figures of note here. One is Neymar, the soccer player. Um, you may recognize him. Um, and this really is um, hits on the nationalist theme. Okay. Um, and Neymar and half the Brazilian national team was super Bolsonaro um, advocates. Uh, another person in this picture, the one in the microphone, is a very prominent evangelical leader. He's a televangelist, basically. And um, he campaigned for him strongly, very anti-homosexual, um, anti-abortion, anti-LGBTQ. He is worth $100 million, $150 million by Forbes' recent analysis. And today... He um, got a lot of people out on the streets by busing them to the pro Bolsonaro rally. Uh, I also included a picture of the Amazon, which took a huge hit under the Bolsonaro period because Bolsonaro used decrees to try to lift um, different protections. And he also um, deprived the, in, the Environment Ministry of Resources uh, that could effectively um, implement scrutiny of Amazonian burdening. Uh, he also fired the head of a satellite agency that noted that um, the Amazon was seeing just an unprecedented level of burning. Um, oh, final picture before we start, um, Brazil took a huge hit under COVID and the photo with the that this is a photo of coffin coffins basically um these were seen um these sorts of photos were taken during the the height of covid brazil suffered over 700,000 deaths bolsonaro at first rejected well not at first there 16 times he rejected pfizer or moderna from coming into the country um 
finally, the governor of Sao Paulo said, this is getting serious. I'm going to negotiate on this own. And it was Pete, it was governors that brought the vaccine into Brazil. And so this was one of the results of this delay. Um, to the right, you also see uh, a lot of military officers. There was an expansion of military officers in the cabinet and bureaucracy under Bolsonaro. And uh, I'll tell you why in a minute. Okay, so the questions are, who was this individual who seemed to come out of nowhere? How did he, someone like this, possibly win the presidency in 2018? How did he govern? Um, why could he actually not install autocracy? That, that would have been his goal. But I would say he fell far short. And here we see a lot about the answers lie in Brazil's political system and in public sentiment, I would say. Um, he also lost. Okay, it's very rare for an incumbent politician in Brazil, an incumbent president to lose. So although he did a very poor job, it was still notable that he lost. Not by much, but he did lose. So we have to look at that. Um, what chance is there for a comeback? Um, even if he himself, Bolsonaro, doesn't come back, what about the movement? Um, is there a possibility of the movement to come back without him, the person? And then... Um, I take a look at whether the what the fate of Brazilian democracy is. So beginning with who he was, um, Jair Bolsonaro, before coming president, he was a former army captain, but one that um, was always in trouble with the higher command. Um, he was actually relieved um, from the army because of insubordination. And that was uh, mouthing off about the how low military salaries were. He spent over 20 years as a um, kind of low profile backbench um, deputy in the National Congress. So the equivalent of our House of Representatives. And he really had one issue and it was about treating the military better and having more law and order. So by law and order, he meant um, sort of tougher rules towards crime. Um, he is a self-proclaimed evangelical. His middle name happens to be Messias. Um, turns out he's really Catholic though. So um, despite the re rhetoric, um, people question whether he truly is a Pentecostal. He's married to one, however, and he um, makes use of her connections to the evangelical community. One third of all Brazilian voters are evangelical. So this is an important um, point of uh, contact. Um, he's a con cultural conservative and really a provocateur. So he knew that he couldn't make it higher than being a backbench type deputy until the culture wars really gained steam and he could step into the fray, especially since the main party in power for the prior period had been the Workers' Party, and they had left the country uh, in a not great situation, which we'll talk about in a second. So he's just frontally anti-feminist, frontally anti-homosexual, frontally anti-intellectual, he makes fun of university students. He calls them leftist psychos. Sometimes I think that myself, but I don't say that. He's one of these people that um, just blurts out uh, what he's thinking at the moment. Um, very anti-cosmopolitan. So he has no tolerance for people like Greta Thunberg who talk about the environment in the Amazon. So he's made it clear, no foreigner should have any views that they air publicly about the Brazilian Amazon. Um, he also um, has been a big promoter of uh, nostalgia for the military regime. And the military ruled in Brazil from 1964 to 1985. And, you know, I think we, a lot of the press focuses on Bolsonaro as a galvanizer of polarization. And he certainly added fuel to the fire. But that's only half the story. He's a symptom. 
of the fact that Brazil was highly polarized and he rode that wave all the way to the presidency. Okay, so um, how did Brazil elect a person like this? And I think here we need to look at the context. Um, the context was one in which um, there were problems when he came, when right before, it, it, there were problems left by the Workers' Party when their last person was impeached, left through impeachment in 2016. Um, there was an economic crisis. Brazil lost 8% of its GDP within a period of a few years. Um, there was high unemployment um, and Brazil had done well in a previous commodity boom. That commodity boom was over and it was in free fall. So he was able to take advantage of this context. And given that the workers party, the more left-leaning workers party had governed from 2003 to 2016, they were the obvious target to blame. Okay. Uh, there was also just a crisis of political polarization that I don't think is was just a domestic crisis. Brazil is really part of international trends, and we've had this kind of polarization in our country, and Brazil became part of the more polarized world. Um, as you may have heard, the Workers' Party uh, created a terrible corruption crisis. Um, this involved the state oil firm with kickbacks and bribery, and then illegally diverting money into people's campaign um, funding, campaign fund coffers. Um, and Lula, the Workers' Party president, was in jail um, and could not run for the presidency because of implication in this crisis. So this was serious. The Workers' Party should not get a pass on this. They oversaw the single biggest corruption scheme in Brazilian history. So Bolsonaro wasn't part of that, so he could make a big deal of that and blame it on the PT. And that blame was rightfully placed. Um, there was also a very serious public security crisis. Um, by the 2017, the 17 of the 50 most violent cities were in Brazil, and they tended to be in the north and northeast around drug um, trafficking routes, um, murders, the murder rate had gone up substantially in the prior years before Bolsonaro won. Crime affects everybody, um, and it affects especially poor people in some sense because they can't drive around in an armored car. They can't live in a gated community. They can't send their kids out of the country. And so while people wondered why a poor poor people would not vote for the Workers' Party and vote for Bolsonaro. High crime is one of uh, the reasons they were attracted to him. So um, basically, I have a quote in an, one of my Journal of Democracy articles. Bolsonaro energized all voters who detested the Workers' Party, and he energized voters who detested everyone. So this was really an anti-establishment um, kind of campaign, everybody but me is been part of the Brazilian establishment and that means corruption and insider dealing and all of this. Now, one reason <laughs> Bolsonaro wasn't involved in any of this was he never, he had never held executive office. The people who are really implicated in corruption tend to be mayors, governors, and presidents. So uh, while he presented himself as, himself as clean, one of the issues was he didn't ever have really the opportunity to be corrupt. Okay, so who, who to support, what is the core support base of Bolsonaro? And both in bringing him to the presidency, but also um, supporting him, 
during the presidency and even now. Uh, I would say his core supporters have to do with the following. And the the saying for this is the BBB coalition, the Bala, that means bullet, the boy, that means ox, and then the Biblia. So um, the law and order group, so people who wanted more public security and easier getting of arms um, really supported Bolsonaro, sort of the police community, lower ranking military officers, and then just a lot of poor people who said, this is enough. We need um, we need the police to take control here. Um, and the second big source of his strong support is, is the um, agribusiness. So agribusiness has grown remarkably in Brazil in the last few years. So we're talking about huge soy farms, huge cattle ranches, and um, this is causing a sort of savannahization of the lower Amazon. Um, and so this group tends to really not want environmentalists meddling in their profits. Um, the China is the single biggest destination for Brazilian agribusiness. And that's convenient because China doesn't care that much about Brazil trashing the environment in order to get these exports to them. The Europeans care more about it. So the fact that China has opened up as a destination for agribusiness is great for this group. Uh, very strong supporters of Bolsonaro. And then a third group that is very strong it tends to be pro um, Pentecostal Christians. And so these are pastors who also many times hold political positions. Um, many of the big pastors in Brazil are essentially politicians. Uh, their congregations and very importantly, radio and television networks and social media networks. So Bolsonaro can communicate in one second with his base through a Twitter or an, an X message. So just some photos. This is, he really cultivated the agribusiness lobby. So these people are very um, important in the Brazilian Congress. And the Brazilian Congress is very malapportioned. Both the Senate and the House have are more weighted towards big Western rural states. Um, so they have a lot more power than their population would suggest. Um, and there's a lot of money to be had with this lobby. Um, the evangelical community, Bolsonaro really tried to cultivate, even though it turns out he's not really an evangelical, um, but you would think he was given um, some of the per performance and the, and, his, and the use of his wife as, as someone who is genuinely religious. So here are some photos there. And again, this is opportune because this gets him a connection to, to the public through radio, television, and social media. And it aligns with um, his views, his side of the culture wars. Okay, and this, um, Brazil, believe it or not, had quite... Um, restrictive gun laws before Bolsonaro. This was one of the things, he didn't actually get that much done. This was one of the things that he did get done to um, re to lessen, relax gun laws. And gun sales went way up under him. Shooting ranges, I guess if you have a gun, you better know how to shoot it. So these shooting ranges were open, opening and people were going to them. You also saw, interestingly, more... Um, former police and military officers starting to run for city council and mayor's offices, so lower office, law, lower offices. You know, interestingly, it's the um, states that control the police. So um, despite all the talk of law and order, it's not really clear what he did about it other than release arms. Um, the other thing is he claims that murders went down under him, and they did, but Brazil was shut for a year and a half due to COVID. And if you don't have people on the streets, you will have fewer murders. 
Okay, so how did he govern? This is really the populist story here. Um, he could not work with Congress. First of all, he didn't want to work with Congress. He wanted to just run Brazil by himself with through an unmediated connection to the masses. Brazil has 217 million people. It's a modern country that is very complex. You're not going to run the place through Twitter. Um, but he was not linked to much of a political party. As a matter of fact, he had to shop around. He, he tried out three parties before he ran for president. And then he didn't have good relations. He didn't know how to work the Congress. Um, so Congress really, many people turned against him and it wasn't a good venue to get any, anything done. He also was very anti-science and had very little regard for expertise, including that of his own economists. So his own economists were very frustrated that he wasn't listening to them. He also um, took a long time to understand that COVID would be a real threat. He was known to say things like, oh, I'm an athlete, so I won't get it. Well, he did get it. And uh, he also... Following Trump, I, there was just a small lag. He adopted the idea that hydrochloroquine cured COVID, which it doesn't. Um, so the scientific community was done with him also. Um, the biologists and environmentalists, um, Brazil has a very strong scientific community, um, were um, had had it with him and his de denial that um, flora and fauna were being devastated in the Amazon. Um, he also really alienated the judiciary. And this is important because these are the people that are after him now, the Supreme Court and the Electoral Supreme Court. Um, to give you one idea of just defying the rule of law, he has three sons that are involved in money laundering and other nefarious activities. So the head, the federal police was closing in on some of the activities of his son. So he just decided to fire the federal police, the head of the federal police. And that got into a big judicial thing and it didn't end well. Um, so he kept seeking support in crowd pleasing and shooting his mouth off and Twitter and other social media networks. It turns out, though, you can't really run a country that way. That's diffuse support, but that's not going to pass legislation. It's not going to get you a vaccine, um, and it proved very thin. Uh, given that he mobilized hundreds of thousands of people today, though, that, that really is his M.O. So when he really got in trouble and Congress wasn't passing anything and the judiciary was after him and... Um, really high level experts, scientists, economists um, were frustrated with him. He went to the military. And so you saw a big expansion of military officers, some retired, but some active duty in the cabinet. I think it um, is more than just functional though. I think that's where he's most comfortable, talking to police and military officers. He never went to university. He was um, very frequently seen at diplomatic events, talking to security guards instead of um, embassy personnel. He just is not comfortable in the civilian milieu. Um, and he really did seek refuge in the military. Now, it turns out the absolute high brass, so professional military officers had no use for him. And I'll give you one example. When the Supreme Court ruled against something he didn't like, ruled against him and he didn't like it. He tried to get the Air Force to run, to fly planes above the Supreme Court because to try to break the windows through the, um, through whatever a, 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 a supersonic jet does. At that point, the head of the arm, the Air Force just said, you know, <laughs> we don't do things like this. Um, okay, so the results of this were gridlock. He didn't actually get much done, just chaos. Every day was an emergency and a chaos. Um, lots of fuel on the fire of polarization. 
and poor governing results. Um, the economy didn't do much under him. And uh, I would say the poorest, most obvious governing result was COVID went through the roof. Okay, so why could he not install autocracy? So I thought about this and I thought about the other speakers and their countries. And so I'm, I focused on five things that I think make Brazil a place where it's gonna be hard for someone to really hunker down and install an autocracy. Brazil is a federal country and it has strong governors. Some of these governors were against him and some of them were initially with him, but saw the policies and just said, we can't have this. We're gonna use our gubernatorial power and go against the president. So who brought the vaccine, the COVID vaccine to Brazil? It was the governor of Sao Paulo who had initially been an ally, but just said, I'm sorry, people are dying and I have the power to negotiate this vaccine. So I'm bringing it to, to, a, to a state with 30 million people. And then other governors followed suit. Um, some, he would, uh, it turns out Bolsonaro would have to negotiate with governors to send the military in to specific um, states when there were riots and drug trafficking was getting out of control. So governors would have to be consulted. That's another point where Bolsonaro couldn't just have his way despite all the bluster. Uh, and then there remains, for all its faults, it's not perfect, there's, there is a strong opposition party in Congress, and that's the Workers' Party. And Congress proved quite assertive um, in both denying some of his legislation, but pushing through some legislation that he didn't approve of. Um, very, very importantly, the Supreme Court has played quite a role in, um, in checking Bolsonaro. So it's strong and it's independent. Now, sometimes I think it gets a little carried away. So to enforce the rule of law, it's breaking the rule of law. Um, some of the recent measures, I think, have gone a little bit beyond their mandate, but it's um, in the direction of checking, of checking Bolsonaro. And then Brazil does have a strong and independent media. It has... Um, as you might imagine, a proliferation of different media outlets like we've seen in this country and in many Western countries. But it does have a um, an independent media and that's been important and a good investigatory media. Okay, um, the other thing is the high ranking military, while they liked being consulted and they liked higher budgets, and they liked an expansion of their presence in their bureaucracy. When it came down to it, the central command, so leaders of the arm, Army, Navy, and Air Force just were not willing to go along with his, um, Bolsonaro's extreme antics. Um, and so I think that's another important kind of stopping point. So I talked to someone at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and this person um, had lots of experience in the Southern Command, and uh, he's now in the Army Attaché office in Argentina. And he said it was clear, the U.S. military made it clear, but they didn't even have to make it clear. There, all bets would be off for any kind of military aid or relationship if the top command went and supported a coup. Okay, so um, that checked him in power. Um, so Bolsonaro lost a bid for re-election. He didn't lose by much. He lost by 1.8 percentage points. So you can see this as, hmm, he almost won or he lost. So I'll look at both sides of that coin. Um, first of all, it's very rare that a Brazilian president really loses re-election. And one reason it's so rare is if you hold the Brazilian presidency, you have um, you can play with a lot of federal economic resources. 
And so presidents have used these to build support bases and win re-election. So it is quite a telling statement that he lost. Uh, why did he lose? Well, first of all, you have to look at the opponent. Um, so the opponent was someone who was in jail um, in during the election that Bolsonaro won. So this person is from the Workers' Party. It's Luis Inacio Lula da Silva, and he had been president from 2003 through 2010, and then later got charged with all this corruption. Well, first of all, he had a very loyal, unwavering base, and everybody came out for him. Beyond that, though, he had a very good run with, e with the economy when he was president. And he looked like someone that the it look he looked like the only person that could really go up against Bolsonaro and conceivably win. So um, that guarantee he, he Lula started with about a third of the electorate solidly behind him, and with the party that had stayed with him. Um, many voters outside of Bolsonaro's core support base, though, outside the, the agribusiness, the evangelicals, and the, um, the law and order crowd, they just saw Bolsonaro as too erratic. Every day was some crisis. They questioned his competency and inability to take feedback. That's the covid um, he could not work with his own team of experts, um, even his head economist. Um, he broke with his head economist. Um, his policy in the Amazon was just too rapacious. Okay, it's one, the Amazon is not going to turn into a park, even under the Workers' Party. The best they are looking for is sustainable development. But this was just um, a just release of all regulations and of all scrutiny. Um, many people felt that Bolsonaro was bad for Brazil's image, um, j just sounding off about Greta Thunberg and uh, people meddling in Brazil's affairs. He was quite isolationist um, and it, very close to Trump, which some people did not like um, because they felt he was basically too pro-American. Um, and so folks... The interesting thing is there were a, a significant share of people who had voted for Bolsonaro shifted their votes. Um, and that put Lula over the edge, over the winning line. Um, interestingly, Brazil has one of the most foolproof, high-tech, modern voting systems in the world, electronic you can cast a vote in the middle of the Amazon and three seconds later, it gets recorded in Brasilia. Uh, the US has actually looked at the Brazilian electronic voting system. It's hard to claim fraud with this voting system um, because the votes are so quickly counted and because it's just been assessed upside and down as being fraud proof. So he couldn't credibly claim fraud that took that out. And interestingly, many of his allies that same day of, of the election, they actually won. So some of his right-wing allies won gubernatorial and congressional seats. So they weren't going to support any charges that the electronic voting system didn't work because it worked for them. Um, and so you saw a lot of opportunism. In any case, he lost to Lula, the Workers' Party candidate, by 1.8 percentage points. However, that's not the end of the story. Um, as you might know, Brazil had its January 6th, except it was January 8th, and it was January 8th of this year. And... Um, his supporters came out in full force. So one of the big signs at that rally was what you see a lot from Bolsonaro supporters, Brazil above everything, God above all. Um, and you see that from a woman who's basically just smashed a window um, of the Brazilian Congress and is holding up her sign. And um, so this is the Brazilian Senate and House that people are scaling here and 
the the one to the the photo to the right and this was to protest the defeat of bolsonaro to lula and you know people say well what was the objective of this um the the wildest objective was this this was going to provoke so many people including the military to come in um eliminate lula's victory and reinstate bolsonaro so that's pretty far fetched given how um brazil has been a democracy since 1985 and this just in any rational calculation this just is an extreme scenario so um i included this because many people were calling for military intervention um and so you see just the scale of this destruction and call for the military etc so um how do we look at this the many people focus on how narrow the defeat was they say given that this wasn't actually that successful a government in terms of the output um how could he have lost by so little um the fact that he lost by so little still has his supporters out there raises the idea of some kind of a comeback. Um, clearly, his views do hold resonance. Um, they resonate among many Brazilians. Brazil, most Brazilians are socially conservative. They don't like the LGBTQ focus in Brazil. They do not want abortion rights. Um, so there are it's a polity with a lot of cultural conservatives. Um, many of these think he's too provocational, but, but that's sitting at the base here. Crime is a problem. There's just no denying that. Again, it's not clear exactly what he did for it, but his law and order message is important. And until now, he's been able to say he wasn't corrupt, except this is losing credibility because more and more stories are coming out about his corruption. Okay, so th those are positives for him coming back. These are the negatives or the reasons I think it is unlikely to happen. Um, interestingly, 85% of all Brazilians polled take exception to the capital riots, the insurrection. Even strong supporters of Bolsonaro reject the fact that people invaded the capital. Um, and so only 15% of the entire Brazilian electorate that has been polled was in favor of the storming of the capital. So this hurt Bolsonaro quite a bit. Um, he's also been banned from office until 2030. So he cannot run anyway because he was banned. Now he was banned because he, he they were looking to get him on something. And he spoke at an ambassadorial meeting. So many and many ambassadors were there. Um, and he called in to question the electronic voting system. Now, most people say, what law did they use to get him out on that? Is there a law that says you can't criticize the electronic voting system? They found a way to do it. So he's actually cannot run for office. Um, in the last couple of weeks, um, what's come up is the fact that there might be petition possible additional charges. And these speak to direct involvement in the riots. So um, inciting folks, he's on tape talking to many people in the cabinet saying, okay, we've got to stop Lula from running. How about supporting this insurrection? So not only is it possible there will be extra charges and a longer time out of running, he, um, that would he would just simply be old to, too old to run by the time he did, but he could actually go to prison. Okay, um, so 
high status people have started to go to prison now in Brazil. Lula was in prison. Um, many of the top people involved in the, the Petrobras corruption scheme, they went to prison. Um, so I would say compared to other countries, Brazil is resisting autocracy. Okay, one, um, two things before we end. Um, people have raised the issue of, okay, what if Bolsonaro himself, Jair Bolsonaro, is in jail or just can't run? Can someone run in his place that represents the same legacy? So um, he does have three sons. Here they are. Um, for a while, people thought one of them would come forth and try to take his place, but they now are involved in, or one is being indicted on money laundering. Once they're under investigation for different misdeeds. So they may be in legal trouble too. Um, there is a legal firestorm around them. So this is his wife, Michelle Bolsonaro. She has not been charged with anything. Um, she is much more contained and um, doesn't spout, doesn't blurt out the first thing that comes to mind. Um, they used her in the campaign to try to win back women to the cause because he was alienating women with just these ludicrous remarks. She just has a better interpersonal dynamic. So many people thought she would come into the fore. She's a good speaker too. Um, I think that's not gonna happen though. I don't think she has it in her and I, I don't think she would have his, so this would be a strong woman, not a strong man. Um, I think this idea is fading. So um, David Forsyth asked, if I would address whether democracy can be saved or not. And I think the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, Brazilian public opinion is favoring democracy, not in high numbers and not as strongly as I would like to see. But the antics of the last few years and the chaos and all um, have led at least a majority of people to say no under any something like 40% say under any condition, we'd rather have democracy. And then there's a middle category under most conditions, we really prefer democracy. So that is that is going to help sustain democracy in Brazil. Um, I'm surprised at how many people disapprove of the January 8th insurrection. 85% um, of all Brazilians say we, we can't go there. And even Bolsonaro voters just said, this is where I get off the boat. We're not having, we're not having um, this kind of politics. Um, the third thing that I think is very important is the independent courts are willing to take action. Um, so in much shorter time than the US in um, coming up with the report against people in January 6th, um, the Brazilians had many of the top people who were actually engaged in the insurrection taken out and jailed. Um, it looks like the governor of the federal district was probably in on the planning. Um, he is under extreme legal problems now. And I wouldn't be surprised if Bolsonaro takes the hit for his involvement. Um, Again, my slight reticence on this is I think the Supreme Court may be overstepping some of its own bounds in, in sort of to help the rule of law. They're breaking the rule of law. But in any case, this is happening. Uh, we also see this in Poland, too. Um, the, the new prime minister, Tusk, I guess he's a prime minister, not a president, um, needs to get out some people that are inconveniently in the way and the courts are moving them out, but it's not clear what um, what their legal right to do so is. So I worry a little bit about this, but in any case, the courts are taking action. Uh, Congress pro has proven quite resilient. A lot is going through Congress, even Bolsonaro um, allies. They're conservative. They're supporting the the. Biblia, the boy, and the um, Bala, but they're doing it through the rule of law. And I mean, that that is a big step 
that that's an improvement upon doing it through decree and um, mobilizing the masses on the streets. Um, and then I take a lot of faith in Brazil's electronic voting system. It it just renders claims of fraud not credible. It gets the results out quickly. The quicker you can get out the results, the less room there is for fabrication. Um, and that's that. And then, although um, some retired military officers have conspired with Bolsonaro and some lower ranking military sort of enlisted types are very pro-Bolsonaro, and some of the police were involved, without a doubt, in the uh, uprising. The absolute high command has basically said, we are not going there. Um, we will stand by the rule of law. And for Brazil, that's quite uh, quite in advance. So um, that's it. Um, thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunter, uh, for a, essentially a firsthand report on a place that we know only what we read about in the paper. I have one quick sort of small question, uh, but not too small. I understand that India and Brazil, among a few other places during COVID, essentially thumbed their noses at the, uh, the big pharmaceutical organizations and said, hey, work with us, give us a fair price, or we'll just manufacture our own. Um, did that happen in Brazil? Uh, they did not end up doing that, but that would be a credible threat because um, Brazil broke the patents on the HIV AIDS drugs and manufactured their own. Um, so the threat was credible, but they ended up importing um, the, I forget whether it was Pfizer or Moderna, but one of the uh, mainline drugs. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's important here is Brazil does not have an anti-vax tradition. Bolsonaro tried to introduce that, but the population itself, uh, childhood vaccinations are really high. They're, they're like 98, 99%. There is not an anti-measles vaccination campaign going on. Bolsonaro tried to introduce it, but most Brazilians are pro-vaccine. And so um, once the governor of Sao Paulo said, we're going to bring in, um, I, I think it was Pfizer, it might have been Moderna. Um, it was one of the main ones. Uh, that sort of broke it and it came in and people got it. Um, it took a while though, and that's one reason you see the death rate you do. Hmm. Our moderator, uh, Dr. Hunter, will bring questions out of the chat when he gets organized here. Um, I think that's all right. Okay. Have, but, well, let me just say another thing. Brazil has a very good basic um, public health system. So um, it has these capillary networks, you know, into Amazonian villages. So once they got the vaccine, they were very efficient in being able to sort of pump it out into the population. Hmm. One thing you didn't mention, but I wondered about indigenous group rights during the Bolsonaro. Uh, I assume they didn't fare very well. They did not fare very well at all. They did not fare very well. And that's part of the military past of Bolsonaro, just feeling like everyone needs to be a Brazilian. We don't have any idea. This idea that it's a plurinational state is out. Um, he, uh, the military, especially his brand of it, doesn't like the idea that many of the indigenous groups kind of go back and forth between parts of Venezuela and Brazil. And, you know, Brazil borders eight countries. Um, they just think Indians should be Brazilians and um, abide by Brazilian law. So they did not fare, fare very well at all. Okay, we can go to the chat box questions. Okay, here are your questions from the chat. The first one is, in today's world, the term evangelical can equate with various meanings. Are you equating evangelical with Pentecostal? Essentially, yes. Um, the Yes, the Brazilian 
Portuguese word for Pentecostal, they call themselves evangelical, but basically I mean Pentecostal. All right. So, your next question is, from your descriptions, it sounds like the military has distanced itself from the years of military rule, but that maybe Bolsonaro wanted to try to connect back to that time. What is your sense of Brazil's moving forward from its military rule? Is re-electing Lula an indicator of a healthy democracy? I think, um, first of all, the military have pretty high popular approval. Um, because they are developmental. Um, you know, a lot of the technology was brought to Brazil by the military. They built roads in the Amazon. You know, they run vaccination, the main Navy runs vaccination campaigns up and down the Amazon. They, um, they work at um, um, mosquito, elimination to cut out dengue fever, which is a terrible um, mosquito vector borne uh, disease in Brazil. So the military do a lot of these things. And so uh, also if you're a really poor person in the deep Amazon, you will probably see an army dentist um, before you see anyone other kind of dentist. So they have pretty high popular appro approval. One reason the military didn't want to go further with um, um, Bolsonaro's antics was they worry about their popular approval and they did not want to see it go down. And um, it did take a hit when Bolsonaro appointed as head of the COVID campaign, an army officer that knew nothing about public health or logistics or anything else. He did a disastrous job and the military said, we basically have to get out of this because our reputation is going to be ruled, uh, ruined. We're going to stay in our own lane here, do what we're decent at and not get overly involved politically or overly involved in things that we don't have any competence at. Um, so I think they've, they've um, taken with them what they did in military rule, sort of more developmentally in civic action and have tried to cut out the repressive side of it and um, getting involved. They do not want to um, do drug trafficking interdiction in Brazil's favelas. Um, it's very clear the top command does not want that because there will be human rights violations Military are trained to inflict le lethal force. They are not trained to, to run community action and um, to work with the public in enforcement. Um, so they really don't want a part of this. And so I think the military, while it, it looks more mixed than it is because he has brought in retired officers who have old ideas into his cabinet, or he did, the actual more modern force that is plays a role in command does is very worried about the long-term image of the military and so they want to retain what makes the military popular in brazil and not go down the paths where they could really hurt their reputation what is the current abortion legal status it's not legal um, there is no sort of there. there there's no ab abortion. Uh, there may be, you know, in exceptional cases for um, late term horrendous problems or if the fetus is um, not going to be at all viable, there might be some exceptions that doctors will do. But the actual law is that th there is no abortion. Could I jump in just for a moment? Um, that's very different from what has happened in Argentina and Chile. Or Colombia. Or Colombia also, yeah. yeah. So now, Brazil is a country of laws and then practices. Hmm. I assure you, lots of people are getting abortions in Brazil, but legally it's still out. Lula tried to... Um, the current president tried to move towards 
a discussion about legalizing it and he pulled back on it because he could see that it was going to be a, a non-winning point for him. Mm. So this is an area where Brazil is quite socially conservative. Does Brazil have the equivalent of Fox News, a very popular channel that spreads propaganda in favor of the strongman? <laughs> yes, yes, it does. It does. And some of my friends have said, oh, my God, when did my aunt start watching this? Um, yes. Um, and Brazilians watch a lot of TV. Um, the average, I was just looking at this, the average Brazilian household has the TV on for five hours a day. So you can watch a lot of this sort of thing. We see that there are millions of Brazilians living in favelas and slums. Are they politically aware? Do they vote? Are they law and order folks or because the police have cracked down on them taking the opposite stance? Um, I should have said voting is obligatory in Brazil. Um, mm. It's an oblig a country of mandatory voting and you get fined if you don't vote. Um, so Brazil has an extremely high voting rate. You don't have to do it. You can get out of it if you're over 70 or if you have mobility problems. Um, but even if you're out of the country and you carry a Brazilian passport, um, they make sure you vote with some frequency. Um, poor people in the Northeast are very pro-Workers' Party because they Lula and the Workers' Party um, brought forth lots of social policies that um, helped these people and made them lifelong Workers' Party fans. So that's the heart of their support. The support in the favelas of Rio and Sao Paulo is mixed because many people, you know, we hear about the human rights violations and say, oh, how awful. I bet the people who live here don't like the police and they don't like human rights violations. Uh, the tends to be more that they don't like the criminals. And many people voted for Bolsonaro who are poor and live in favelas because they just said the criminality had gotten so high that they were willing to have the police make a few errors in order to go after the narcos. This is what's happening in El Salvador. Bukele just won 83% of the vote in a re-election, and he's basically cleaning house in El Salvador. Not asking too many questions before he puts people in jail. And um, I think they've put 70,000 people in jail since he's come to office. Uh, of course, some of these people are innocent, um, but people feel like they can walk the streets and they're more concerned with being able to have their kids go out and play than they are with the mistakes on the human rights front. So, um, so this is one point at which Bolsonaro is attracting the votes of poor people. Dr. Hunter, back to the voting for just a moment. I understand that students who are here in the U.S. on scholarships were uh, threatened with losing their scholarships if they didn't vote. Correct, correct. My co-author actually has to go and vote because... Um, she will get she won't be able to go back and do research they have some way of blocking it um if she doesn't vote in i think presidential elections i don't think she needs to vote in every lower level election but they actually monitor this if you carry a brazilian passport um so i will tell you at the at the consulates and embassies where people voted it was the the bolsonaro crowd came out with their yellow and you know their brazilian flag shirts and the workers party folks came out with their red shirts so even abroad the vote was very polarized and everyone was announcing who they were going to vote for and what they wore 
By the way, the diaspora vote went pro Bolsonaro. Really? Yep. Mm -hmm. The Miami vote is super Bolsonarista. Mm -hmm. Well, the Cuban population is fairly uh, conservative in Florida, too. Right. So many of the Pentecostal churches, um, many of the Pentecostal churches um, were very pro Bolsonaro. And, and they're in places like Miami and Boston, believe it or not, Miami, Boston, uh, Houston. Yep. This is the last question from the chat. It seems that Trump has been much better at taking over a political party than Bolsonaro was. Do you agree? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. One of Bolsonaro's weaknesses is he has not been able to insert himself very well into a political party. Um, Trump has been much more successful at, than, at this than Bolsonaro. So interestingly, today, Bolsonaro had has been... This was a planned rally. He wanted people to come out and support him. Many of the top politicians said, oh, I really hate to go out and show open support for Bolsonaro. I'm conservative. I'm against abortion. I'm not wild about LGBT rights. I'm very pro-public security. But I don't support Bolsonaro, and I don't want to publicly come out and ally myself. What we're seeing in the US is very different. Um, Republican politicians are afraid not to ally themselves with Donald Trump. So I would say that um, that this is, that whoever asked this is very right on or made this statement. Um, Trump has been much more successful in taking over the Republican party than um, Bolsonaro has been. As you were discussing uh, many of the traits of Bolsonaro, uh, it was hard for me not to think about some of the same traits in our former president. I know, you know, towards the end of the campaign, his advisors were saying, basically, the less you talk, the better. Let your wife do the talking. <laughs> um, so it was like one just insult after the next and his advisors had to sit down with him and saying listen you want these people's votes stop insulting them um and when he couldn't do it they were saying okay you can show up but let your wife talk you didn't talk very much about lula um tonight do you think he's gained popularity since the last election his approval is pretty high. His approval is pretty high, but he's gaff prone too. He just came out with this outrageous statement that um, what Israel was doing was tantamount to what Hitler did in the Holocaust. Um, the It caused a diplomatic crisis. The Brazilian diplomatic corps did not appreciate that comment. Um, so he's um, not his old self. Um, I will tell you also, news is coming out. I mean, the whole corruption of the Lula presidency last time took place around the state oil company. It appears that he's kind of moving people around and firing pe some people and putting his allies in place, um, using public funding in somewhat questionable ways. So while his approval so far has been pretty high, um, Lula is not an angel and he is really working the Brazilian political system. I also think he's lost his mojo. I mean, he used to have a lot of personal charm and ability to work with a lot of people. Um, he's getting more and more gaff prone as time goes on. After he made that remark about the Holocaust, uh, the Israeli government declared him persona non grata, that he wouldn't be allowed to, to, to visit Israel. Absolutely, absolutely. And do you know what happened today at Bolsonaro's rally? He wrapped himself in an Israeli flag to basically distinguish himself from Lula. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
The people who hated Lula's comments the most, though, were people within his diplomatic corps. Because Brazil has a very high, refined diplomatic corps, and they just didn't find that comment very productive. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that just caused a crisis that did not need to be. With all these challenges to uh, Bolsonaro, is there any credible alternative on the uh, on the right side at this point, Dr. Hunter? Yeah, there are a couple. Um, the president, the governor of a big state, Minas Gerais, is a cultural conservative, but not a provocateur. And um, he's a good manager. And um, he got a very high vote share. And he doesn't insult people. Uh, he's more measured. I think that's a possibility. Um, on the right, that's a possibility. Um, the governor of Sao Paulo is a little more pro Bolsonarista. He did show up at the rally today, although he wavered on whether he was going to do it or not. Um, he would be more extreme right. Um, now, on the side of the Workers' Party, this is a big question. Lula needs to step aside and cultivate new talent. Um, this is his third government. He's getting up there in years. He's, um, I think he's lost his old um, sort of interpersonal charm and certainly lost any sense of being measured. Um, and he's not going to live forever. The Workers' Party needs to cultivate new talent. And they do not have a young person who's really coming up. Does that sound like our politics? <laughs> <laughs> we have two people in their 80s. Um, well, Trump isn't quite 80. Um, so Lula is like the man myth and the legend, even though he was involved in corruption and had a jail sentence. But within the party, um, he takes up a lot of oxygen. Um, but he, I think for the future, the party needs to um, cultivate youth. Hmm. So Rick Goodman said too true. What was Rick Goodman's too true about? The, the need to cultivate new talent? I'm assuming so. It just came in as you were talking. Yeah. Uh, we had one more question come in the chat. Were you saying that big parts of Brazil are both conservative but supportive of real democracy? Yes, there is there there is a group, a, a substantial group that is socially conservative, that's economically conservative, but supportive of a basic democracy. So interestingly, if you look at the polls from the state-by-state -state polls of the Lula-Bolsonaro election. Lula did not win because he increased his support in the Northeast. You know, you know, it would have to be to, to like 90% or something. Lula won because he made inroads into the Bolsonaro vote among white, educated people in the industrial states of Brazil, the center, the, the southwest, the, sorry, the southeast and the south. He managed to shift enough people's votes. These people are basically conservative and they're economically conservative and I'm sure many of them are social conservative. He was able to shift enough votes into his own column, basically because he seemed less reckless. So if you look at polls and if you talk to people, they just said, we want predictability. We don't want a crisis every single day. Um, we don't want someone who is embarrasses us daily. Um, we don't want someone who insults the public. And so there is a there is a conservative group that is not Bolsonarista. And I don't know what... I, I can't pull out a number for you, but it was enough to move votes into the Lula camp away from the Bolsonaro camp last time. 
This is rather a personal, personal question, Dr. Hunter, but in your professional work, as you write about politics, uh, this is a sensitive area. Do you assume that these things will be read in Brazil and that this will influence your ability to travel to Brazil, to communicate with people there? Or do you, you feel know, like Brazil is really open? It's a really open place. Um, it doesn't feel like it's an authoritarian regime or anything. It's a very open place. People are openly critical of the president. Um, and they were critical of Bolsonaro and nothing happened to them. Nothing happened to um journalists who were critical of Bolsonaro. Um, all this journalistic um suppression you hear about in Mexico uh, just is not a Brazilian issue. Um and so um, so I write in the journal of democracy. There's actually a Brazilian, it's translated into Portuguese. People read it. Um, and it's an open society, and uh, the press is quite critical of Lula and Bolsonaro, and um, that just is part of it. I think Brazil is moved beyond what many people sort of see it as. Um, I think it's a more open and more democratic country than Mexico in many ways. You heard a lot about press suppression in the last six years in Mexico. That just doesn't really apply to Brazil. Oh, let me say something else about conservatives that are pro-democracy and at least minimally supportive of Lula. Um, economic interests did very well under the last two Lula governments. Um, business made money hand over fist in the Lula governments from 2003 to 2010. So they didn't, um, so like the Sao Paulo business community was not worried that Lula would come back and make a socialist revolution, not at all. Um, and in some sense, they liked the more predictable, less reckless, just more stable environment for investment. But I will say agribusiness is very important in Brazil. And Lula is much more concerned with what sort of France thinks about torching the Amazon and what the European supermarkets think and what the US thinks. Um, and so the agribusiness groups were, are still quite attracted to Bolsonaro. Hmm. Really? Lula has done a lot to to um, try to get more regulation in the Amazon. In the year that he's been back, Amazonian um, uh, deforestation has gone down substantially. Hmm. Okay, well, that's all the questions we have in the chat. Shall we let everybody unmute and turn video on? Sure. While they're doing that, uh, I know you had a very progressive, uh, I think, Minister of the Environment or Minister of Agriculture, I forget his name. Oh, the Environment. Environment. Jose Luxembourg or something like that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right. Is his influence lasting into the current administration? Well, the, the lasting influence is someone named Marina Silva who is from the Amazon and grew up really poor. She was orphaned. Um, Catholic nuns took her in, made her literate. She actually ended up going to university. She's a big environmentalist. She's Pentecostal too. That's an interesting mix. She's an environmentalist. She works for Lula. She was um, environment minister for about six years under the last Lula government. And she has kind of stepped back into the fore. So that would be an example of someone who is seen as basically progressive environment, part of the Workers Party, but Pentecostal. Um, so I think more so than in this country, you have some Christians that are sort of a little more left leaning. Hmm. And she's been um, very outspoken about the need for more environmental regulation. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, I know Brazil has a huge Japanese um, population. Where do they fall politically? Are they pretty much in the business side of things or? 
a lot of them are professionals like doctors and dentists and um, small business types. That's actually an interesting question. So I'm Japanese too. So um, I fit right into Sao Paulo. My mother was Japanese. Um, I don't know what the Japanese vote looked like. Hmm. Um, I have a hard time seeing the Japanese vote being very pro Bolsonaro, maybe early business class people, but that's a good question. I really, I don't actually know. They don't have near the power that Fujimori had in Peru, for example. No, 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 not at all. So am I supposed to call on people? Well, you could do that if you like. Yeah, I have... they're welcome to unmute and and ask a question. I think that Barry has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I do. Uh, in the U.S., um, Trump's supporters tend to be older rather than younger. Uh, is there an age differentiation in Brazil as well? Uh, you know, interestingly. Um... There was a group of people, and this goes for the current president of Argentina as well, Javier Millet. Young, kind of machista men were very attracted to Bolsonaro and voted in droves for him. Um, and this is the crowd, same crowd that went out and bought guns and go to the shooting range. And People were surprised because they thought, oh, you know, um, well, analysts, I should say, were initially surprised. They thought, OK, the youth vote is going to go left for Lula. In fact, there is this young male um, type that voted very strongly for, for Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro did much better among men than among women. So m rather than being um, generational, uh, what you really see is a um, gender divide with men being much closer to Bolsonaro than women. And you, you see this in, in um, Argentina, too, with the new president, Javier Millet. Hmm. We have other questions from the audience. Please unmute and come in. Yes, Priscilla. An environmentalist still a pretty dangerous occupation. <laughs> uh, actually, this past year, two people, one of them British, died in the Amazon being environmentalists. I think it's a little less dangerous than it was in the eighties. You know, nuns. I mean, uh, there's a famous case of a nun who died. Um, Chico Mendes was a rubber tapper. He died. So I would watch my step being an environmentalist. But the people that I would worry about would be kind of vigilantes hired by ranchers. Mm -hmm. Worry about them more than about, say, the military gunning you down. I would definitely worry more about um, kind of private interest taking you out than I would about a public security person. Um, so while it's not military rule and there was a lot of, um, in, well, irregular warfare, let us say, during military rule, I, I would watch my step as an environmentalist in the Amazon, even now. We read a lot about the... Um big landowners and all hiring these vigilante types is does the government turn a blind blind eye to that pretty much or do they try to maintain any control it's hard to have control up in the amazon it really is um it's it's a place where the state the brazilian state just is not that powerful and a lot of um police issues and justice issues are under state control. And I will say, um, probably this will not surprise anyone, the Amazonian states tend to be governed by really conservative 
individuals who are also themselves tend also themselves to be ranchers or be huge farmers mainly ranchers um and so i would rather i if i would take my bet in sao paulo in rio any day over a uh, justice being served in an amazonian state hmm. And these state governors have a lot of power, I suppose. Oh, they have a lot of power. They have a lot of power. And in the, I mean, there's there's so many people that are so poor. A lot of people are going to the Amazon to, you know, run tire shops and restaurants and just to support this economy and make money. And and the vote for Bolsonaro in the Amazonian states was huge. Uh, in in several states, over seventy five percent. Now there are not very many votes up there, but if you look state by state, Bolsonaro cleaned up in the uh, Amazonian states. So that's not great for environmental purposes. And what about education as a factor? The people most interested in environmental regulation are young gish educated people in urban centers 2000 miles away from the amazon hmm. um so this is one of the issues a lot of the people who are there besides you know just really indigenous people who live off the rainforest are allied with the uh, the booming economy up there um, in extraction, extraction, farming, ranching, uh, gold mining too, My, uh, huge mining operations up there. I assume that includes oil extraction too, or is that more in Ecuador? No, there's oil up there, but where Brazil is really um, exploring oil is off the coast, deep sea oil exploration off the coast. They're hoping that that's going to be the new Hurrah. Um, but there are tons of minerals in the Amazon. And so this is one of the um, big conflicts, whether, you know, if the Brazilian state knows there are minerals and that's an indigenous area, whether you should make that area off limits to mineral companies or not. Yeah. I mean, we've had some of these issues in the United States. Isn't oh. that it? Oh, oh, sorry. Isn't oh, yeah. there... Sorry, <laughs> isn't there one area under dispute with Venezuela and it's because of the mineral wealth? Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't talk much about Brazil and Venezuela, but um, this is an in interesting relationship. There was very bad blood between Bolsonaro and Chavez, the Maduro. Um, in Venezuela, um, partly because of the political regime, um, but also many Venezuelans have fled into Brazil um, just to flee the regime. And they're going through the state of Horaima. Um, and um, part of the nationalists, you would think, okay, they're fleeing from a socialist regime. Shouldn't Bolsonaro like them? and um, be able to say Brazil is going to be the refuge of people from this socialist regime. But part of the nationalism had an anti-immigrant um, immigrant dimension to it. So even though there really aren't that many immigrants in Brazil, interestingly, if you go back and look at Bolsonaro's speeches, there are illusions that are anti-immigrant that just don't have a basis in objective reality. But it's so much sort of mimicry of the nationalism and right-wing populism of Eastern Europe, not liking immigrants, um, that it's been copied. Um, it was copied in Bolsonaro's speeches. I should also say that Bolsonaro hired Steve Bannon um, as an advisor. And so some of the rhetoric is, is very Steve Bannon-like. Hmm. Are there any questions?
questions as well. Anybody can in, unmute and uh, bring up a question here. We have a few minutes left. Chuck, it's approaching 8.30. So if we don't have any more questions from uh, the gallery, uh, maybe you would like to thank Professor Hunter and sign off. Fine. Yes. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, giving us your up-to-date analysis and projections for the future. It'd be really interesting to see what uh, sort of unfolds in the next few years. Yeah, I'm hoping, you know, I'm, I'm imagining I am more optimistic about Brazil than Zoltan was about Orban <laughs> in Hungary and that Professor Varshney will be about Modi in India. Um, so hopefully I, this injection of optimism actually gets borne out. Um, yeah. These were very interesting questions for me. Um, so I thank you for the questions and I am I thank you for the interest. And, um, you know, Brazil's going to be in the news a lot in this next year, um, in these next few months. And so um, hopefully people will have a framework to kind of understand the news a little bit better when they, when they, um, read it. So um, thank you for your attention. Wendy, obrigada. And, oh, obrigada uh, para vocês. And <laughs> next week, please uh, return and ask your friends to return because we're having a presentation on Erdogan, uh, the president of Turkey, and that will be given uh, by Professor Zera Azar of the uh, University of Connecticut. So join us at the same time next Sunday. Thank you all and, and good night. Good night. Nice to meet you.